So, Amber, you wrote me here. See, you wrote me. I've got it. All right. <laughs> um, and you were talking about having bouts from time to time of acid reflux, perhaps hiatal hernia. Uh, following on with that, maybe some AFib, atrial fibrillation. And you know enough about, you've been around EFT for some time, have you not? Yes. How long? Eight, 10 years. I took your EFT CERT 1 and CERT 2 course. I don't know how long ago. Maybe eight, 10 years ago. Yeah. I started. Or, or more. I've forgotten myself. But <laughs> anyway, those were the tapping days. Um, yes. And you're also one of our our more advanced students is your, in our optimal EFT course and so on. Yes. So much of what I'm going to speak about here, you are familiar with, but not everybody listening and would be familiar. So I'm going to be a little basic from time to time here. Okay. Okay. But, but anyway, these physical issues, as you know, have a cause. Everything has a cause. All right. And, and typically, they are emotional causes. They are angers, griefs, guilts, resentments, fears, and the like that everybody collects. And they end up, they show up physically sooner or later. You're aware of that, yes? Yes. Too much, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Okay. Now, I want to look for emotional causes behind the hiatal hernia, acid reflux, possibly AFib, and so on. That does not mean that if we locate such a thing and we get some results on that sort of thing today, that doesn't mean all those things just go away. It means, hopefully, we will get a good start along that direction. We will start getting peace on some of the issues on some of the emotional causes. And of course, you would need to keep, carry on with that too, because there'd be more pieces and more than we can do in one session. So okay. anyway, before this recording started, uh, you were telling me about some, going back in time, your mother would be very, is critical the right word? Yes. Okay. Um, critical, verbally abusive. All right, give me examples. Oh, wow. Um, just when, okay, this is one that came up for me, um, and I will condense it. Uh, in, I think, I'm going to guess first grade, um, we had a school concert and my parents and grandparents came up to the school uh, to see the concert. It was night in the winter, Christmas concert. We all sang. I was supposed to ride home with uh, the neighbor kids. Um, it, it was, you know, a couple of mile walk home, which we all rode our bikes and, and walked to school back in those days. And so it had snowed and I missed my ride somehow. The neighbors didn't pick me up. I had to walk home. It was terrifying. I thought I was going to die several times trying to climb over different snow drifts and not falling into the highway. And when I got home, um, and my parents and grandparents found out that I had walked home and not caught my ride. My mom yelled at me. I understand now because she was terrified that I could have died, but her reaction was to scream and yell and call me stupid. And why didn't you do this and do that? And, you know, I was six, you know, so, and didn't have the answers for everything. So that would be one example that had come up recently that had a, a 10, um, you know, suds level. And have you worked on that with EFT or unseen therapists? Maybe. 
I don't recall. All right. It just well, came up recently, so I okay. don't think so. Okay. I want to, but let me get behind that a little bit. Okay. Your mother's response, as I hear the story, was, and you see it differently now when you, as you look back at it, but her, her response there was very critical. You are, you use the word stupid, okay? Right. So the real issue here isn't what your mother did or why she did it or that at this point. The real issue is your response to it. See, we're not going to be able to change anything that she did. Okay. That's just like trying to change a baseball score. You're not going to do it. Okay. She did that. You had your response at that time. And we can't change that response either. What we can change is your current response to that issue. And that's what limits you. That's what starts bothering your system. That's the kind of thing that is behind our physical issues like acid reflux, hiatal hernia, AFib, and so on. Right. So you said a minute ago, that was a zero to 10 number, a 10 in intensity. Yeah. If I focus in on it, I can get it to, it well, sometimes is a 10 or get it to a 10. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. I don't want to put you into unnecessary turmoil. So, so, so give me your best guess at the moment. If, if don't do it, I don't want to put you through it. Okay. But if oh, okay. you were, I'm if fine. you were to like close your eyes and vividly imagine thing, go back there, there's your mother yelling at you, you know, stupid. Da, 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 da. What number do you think you would get to currently? 10. All right. Now, as far as you know, again, I want your best guess. If you did that and got to this 10, do you think you would be having acid reflux type hiatal hernia, AFib type symptoms? Or do you no. know? No. You don't know or you don't think you would? Um, as much as I know anything, it, uh, emotional issues have not triggered it before. Okay. Doing optimal EFT on myself for different emotional issues in my past has never triggered um, acid reflux, AFib issues. All right. Okay. So, all right. Let's leave that be for the moment. Let me explore something else with you. When you are experiencing any of these physical ailments that we've been talking about, mm -hmm. um, what causes them? Food or alcohol. So if you, are, as far as you know, if you avoided certain foods and never drank wine or alcohol or something again, you wouldn't have those symptoms? Correct. Oh, okay. But I'd have to never eat again. Oh, so because any food triggers it. Oh, any any, any food any triggers. food will trigger it in the evening. If I eat dinner too late, like six, seven o'clock, if I don't eat at four o'clock and eat five or six o'clock and then go sit on the couch and watch TV. I will usually have a AFib episode every single night with erratic heart beats, diagnosed, medically diagnosed AFib. Oh, really? Okay. So I, I just want to get this straight. Especially you can tell me if you eat after what time you're likely to get AFib. Yes. What, what time? Um, five o'clock. Oh, okay. So you can completely avoid the whole thing if you never eat after five. Yes. Oh, okay. Just the food related trigger. Alcohol is a different trigger. Okay. If I dr drink more than two glasses of wine, alcohol is a trigger. If I drink certain wines, um, uh, California red wine seem to trigger it more than European wines. And if I have three glasses of any wine, that tends to trigger the later 
and it won't trigger it immediately. It's delayed response. It takes two to three hours for the AFib to trigger. I've never heard anything like that before. It doesn't mean it's not valid. I just never heard it. I've just never heard right. it. I keep thinking, I keep thinking, well, okay. If you can't eat, let's just take the eat after five thing. Okay, we'll leave the alcohol out for the moment. Can't eat after five. If you eat after five, then somehow or other you're going to have these symptoms. Correct. And they they were for probably um, three to six, well, I'd say three months occurring. I started going to allopathic doctors um, and even a few that did both allopathic, homeopathic and they had nothing for me um, and weren't sure why. And then through different supplements and health choices, it went away. And then about three weeks ago, it came back. It went away for three, four months. And then and, unless I drank too much, and then about three weeks ago, it came back. The issue reoccurred and, and I don't know why, but the doctors that I'm going to now thinks that, you know, it's stomach food related um, that is doing something to my stomach and that triggers the AFib. When you were young, a child, what time did you eat dinner? five, six o'clock um, with when I remember my mother being more verbally abusive and critical would have been we ate on the dot at four o'clock. Excuse me. Well, I, I asked, I, I was just intuitively nudged to ask that question. But wh why? Interesting. So there you are. There you are. What about four o'clock on the dot? Like that, that's your mother. It's got to be just as exact. It's got to be a perfect time or whatever. The... Well, my stepfather got home from work then. So there was the whole emotional turmoil and um, very good detective work, Gary. Um, my mother remarried and we went to me and my little brother moved into a house with a bear of a stepfather, three new stepbrothers who were very also uh, verbally abusive and a little bit physical, you know, stepbrothers smacking you and stuff, nothing crazy, but just, you know, teasing the little sister, little brother. Um, so we moved into that, into a place, we moved out of my grandmother's house, which was a place of love and safety to a place of torture, hell, I've called it <laughs> emotionally. And I was 10 or 11 when we moved in there and dinner was at four o'clock on the dot. Okay. Well, I can be wrong. But it seems apparent that there is some emotional trigger, some emotional relationship that you have not resolved, having to do with four o'clock, eating early, you know, uh, or else. I'm, I'm sort of hearing that in some fashion. Um, Got to do it just so. Uh, I hear possible fear in there. Uh, how am I doing? Good. Yeah. If you didn't eat at four o'clock, you didn't eat. Okay. All right. If you weren't there, you didn't eat. So we may not be able to pull a logical thread. Maybe we can in time, but for the moment, I'm, I'm seeing an emotional thread. Something about eating early on in the day. Uh, if you violate that, there's a penalty for it. I mean, I, I'm sort of hearing that. You're nodding your head. 
Yeah, um, there was no spankings or grounding or anything. You just didn't eat. The dinner was more stressful because there would be, you know, teasing and maybe some yelling for my stepfather. It was stressful. Okay. It wasn't a family dinner of love and affection like we see on TV. <laughs> It wasn't, definitely wasn't that. Well, very few people listening in, <laughs> uh, Amber, uh, will remember this, but some might. There, when I was growing up, there was this idyllic TV show, Ozzy and Harriet. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were the ideal husband and wife with two sons and everything was perfect. <laughs> the model for how we model for how we should be, but nobody is kind of thing. Right. Like for me, it was June and Ward Cleaver. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah. And, and so it goes, but anyway, so, but we have these models up and the, but the reality is, uh, um, and if you didn't do things just so, and there's a, there's a very strict critical kind of thing. Um, there's a penalty. You're not going to eat. Let's just call it penalty period. But I'm also hearing in there, not only do you not eat, I'm hearing, let me put words around this, uh, and you make sure you correct me because I don't want to start assuming things that aren't, aren't accurate. But I'm trying to put myself in your shoes intuitively. And you need to be cautious. You need to metaphorically tiptoe around your critical mother and your stepfather. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of tension around eating the dinner dinner time around there. There is you better behave. And I'm picking up something we talked about even before the recording. A need to do it right to be perfect with a sort of built in or else the or else meaning. And this is a guess. You got to correct me. Okay. Uh -huh. Meaning I'm going to, there's going to be a penalty, but also meaning I'm going to lose any possible love and I need love. How do we, how did I do? Well, you, you went for the grand slam there at the end. I didn't expect that, that, haymaker to come out of nowhere but well, did it clear the um, fence yeah the end of it's all based on love um it to me it was like eating especially with my stepfather it was like eating next to a bear or a um wolf and that if anything you said or did was out of line that wolf would be that bear would be on you and just mm -hmm you know, rip you emotionally to, th to shreds and you get yelled at. So, and I wasn't used to getting yelled at that often before we moved in there. Well, again, remember, we're always looking for your, re your response to these things. It isn't what el else happened out there because we can't change it. It happened. Right. Yeah. Right. It's your response to these things. And until they get resolved, this is just my experience speaking. Until these things get resolved, your system tends to replay them as the years unfold and you grow older decades later, even in current time. And so if even now, this seems on point to me, but it may be a stretch. So again, you got to correct me. Even now, if you eat after four or five or some early time, there's a penalty and it's called AFib. There's a, there's a, there's a physical reaction that you've developed as a response to this unresolved stuff, which keeps kicking around, keeps kicking around, keeps kicking around. Okay. Right. And I feel like sometimes when I get AFib and it's your heart, I feel like I'm going to die. I don't, <laughs> but you know, it's sometimes scary. Yeah. Yeah. To have that a heart response. I'd rather be sick to my stomach or something because you don't think, okay, I'm going to 
you don't think you're going to die when you get sick to your stomach or feel nauseated. But when your heart does stuff, it gets your attention. Yep. At the moment, at right now, at this very instant, are you having any symptoms with acid reflux, hiatal hernia, AFib at the moment? No. Okay. But when you steered me in a direction of a couple of things, I did um, get a little burp, which is interesting. A little acid reflux no. start, start-ism? Oh, no, no, not really. Just uh, usually uh, belching relieves it. Oh, okay. So that's a good thing. All right. I've never had an emotional issue trigger AFib or acid reflux. Well, I'm, I'm going in the direction that is what's triggering it. Uh, you're just right, not aware from the of past. It. Yeah, from the past. I've never had it triggered by doing EFT or talking about it. All right. Well, okay. We want to, we want to move forward a little bit. We want to start un- undoing, resolving some of the emotional reaction way back then, stepfather, dinner time, and this kind of thing. We want to go there. That doesn't mean that we are the very heart, the bullseye of the target. Um, But I think we're somewhere on the target, that this is my view. Okay. Does that seem right to you or not? Yeah. I I don't know if it's a table leg or tabletop. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm not sure. But if it is a table leg, it's a big one. It's definitely a big one. It might be, you know near a core issue. And when you said I wouldn't receive love if I didn't act right at dinner. Yeah. That okay. definitely core issue. All right. Most people don't recognize that. And I'm glad that you, you do because we, we have, we have this, this longing for love. And in this, I'm getting into some theory here. But uh, quantum physics has shown us over and over and over again that this whole idea of running around on, in separate bodies is an illusion. There's only a oneness. All atoms are, are connected and so on. So the mere fact that we seem separate isn't even really real. Now, some, some newcomers watching this are going to go, oh, but okay. read my book. Okay. <laughs> By the way, read it uh, twice. Yeah, under underneath this, well, I'm talking to listeners, okay. Underneath this video are some essential links. Go there. There's a free ebook. There's some advanced advanced training if you want it. There's a free newsletter. All there, okay. But anyway, anyway, so we long, all of us long for love, and oftentimes we're longing for it even beyond what we're consciously aware of. And it's, this is especially so at children. We learn to sort of compensate later on, but children are a little more raw in that sense. All right. So, right. so there, there you are as a youngster looking for love. And of course, the bear, the wolf, the criti- critical mother, the four o'clock or you don't eat, and all the stuff that goes with that brings up fears, trepidations, and so on, which have gone unresolved and are now showing up in current time. And they, they, they always do that. That's what, if you don't resolve them, they show up sooner or later in well, some that's fashion. that's not fair. Well, I'd, <laughs> I, I'd like a refund. <laughs> Love your sense of humor, dear. <laughs> and ask... Um, Unseen therapist, if I may have a refund. <laughs> Better yet, we found you. So, <laughs> all right. Anyway, anyway, so what I want to do prior to bringing in unseen therapist um, is to start working with you, have some conversations, exploring some things, putting as much on the table, on top of the table as we can. Uh, you know, it's very easy for us to. Have stuff under the table. Want to hide it? Forget about it. Don't want to look at it. You know this kind of thing. We all do it. Human, it's a human tendency. But unseen therapist is not going to bother with stuff that you want to hide and keep. That's your right 
to do, and she's not going to interfere with that. That's where we want to discuss things a little bit. We want to put as much on the table in plain sight that you're willing to let go of and so on. And, and the better we can do that, the more we can get relief from all of that. Okay. So um, let me ask you, let's start with your mother. As far as you know, why would your mother be so consistently critical using the word stupid and things like that? Um, because she was raised in a critical household. Her parents were, her mother was critical. She was forced to grow up at an early age and take care of her little brother and sister. And um, her mother used her as a best friend rather than let her be a child. I, I gather you can see from that that she would, your mother would grow up with a fair amount, maybe a lot of unrest within. Yeah, yeah. Re a lot of resentment, uh, uh, fears, uh, guilt, maybe uh, imperfections. She's just, she should be something other than she is. How am I doing? Yeah, yeah. All right. I, I think those are just based on stories that she told me. Um, I can gather that, but when I knew my grandmother, she was a very different person, but she was, you know, she went through world war two as a nurse and a mass unit. So she had her own psychological issues and she was an alcoholic parent. So she was this is, this is your, your mother or grandmother, my grandmother, okay, okay. my mother's mother yeah okay so there you know there's a whole chain of things right. that contributed to this well one of the things that happens when someone is raised in this fashion and many unfortunately many people are um uh, they're always they're always looking for love. They have this unrest within them, and they don't know what to do with it. They can either start resolving it, but they don't have the tools for it. All right, what they tend to do because it's just too uncomfortable to look at and and experience. They project it out. They blame outside themselves. Mm -hmm. And while my guess is she does not intend to damage her daughter amber all right that is what happens maybe not intentionally but that's just the way she sees it projects out maybe even justifies it by saying if i don't if i call you stupid you won't do it again and that'll help you okay uh, right right yeah okay you're you're hitting too close to home there <laughs> within me because my grandma did it to my mother my mother did it to me and so now i'm doing it to other people it's, it makes total logical sense and, and emotional sense of that's why we do it yeah okay so part that that's all part of reframe and, and the the end result of that is what we want to get from the place where we discuss that academic, oh yeah, that's how it is. Da, da, da. We want to actually own that so we're free of it. We can discuss it all day, academically all day long. Right. Worthwhile, I guess. We so really want, want, to be, we want to be free of it. So you want me to take responsibility for it instead of blaming other people? I don't want you to do anything yet. We're just talking <laughs> about it, okay? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> We're going to see if we can't get unseen therapists in there to give you a little relief on that. But we need to talk first about what we're getting relief from. We want to be more specific and okay. so on. So your, your typical response, although you haven't really said this yet, but your typical response is something like when mother, we'll get to stepfather in a minute, but when mother is your a source of love for you, is being critical and calling you stupid and all these other things. The standard response to that kind of thing is something's wrong with me. 
I'm defective. I'm not lovable. Right. All right. Um, it's not really true, but that that would be the typical response. And I gather that's your response as well. Yes or no? Yes, it feels true. All right. It feels true. So underneath all that is, this is what we want you to own. And you may not own it today, but more repetitions of this will hopefully move you in that direction. That none of these issues are really yours. You are, well, let, let me ask you, let me ask you. Logically speaking, not emotionally. Logically speaking, um, are you lovable? Yes, of course. Okay. Are you good enough? Are you defective? Yes. I mean, define defective, but I mean, I see us as humans all imperfect and that imperfection makes us perfect. We can't well, learn without yeah. making mistakes. So I, don't I, know sort of, that's what... I didn't ask the question very well, as it turns out. So as far as defective is concerned, um, are you any more or less defective than anybody else? No. Okay. Uh, as far as being not good enough, are you any more or less not good enough than anybody else? Maybe. <laughs> well, get, get behind that. Give me some more on that, if you would. <laughs> um, sometimes, yes, I feel less than. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel less than others that, because we don't know. Everybody else looks perfect. You, you don't know what's in their um, closet, their skeleton, the yeah. skeletons in their closet. So every everybody seems like June and Ward Cleaver and Ozzy and Harriet. Uh, Harriet. Yeah. So, well, okay. Let me let me feed something back to you. I was asking you about the logic of not being good enough, and what you responded to me. I'm just picking up on your words. Okay, so we can just explore this a little bit. As you feel that way, that's an emotional response. Okay, you feel like you're not good enough. That's an emotional response. Okay, I'm okay. asking for I'm asking for Logically. the log logic of it. Yeah. Yes, I'm good enough. I'm smart okay. enough, and gosh darn it, people like me. <laughs> All right. Well, so what we want to do, is see, see, your emotional response is different. Right. And that's that's true with just about everybody. Okay. So we want to take your logical response. This is your emotional response, and, and, and make them equal. We want oh, to get, okay. you know, so so that you don't have the emotional baggage. I'm really, I'm not lovable, or I'm not good enough, or any of these other things. We don't have that emotional baggage. We want to be free of that. All right. Now, if we're free of that, now our physical systems. are then more peaceful as well. Uh, whenever we're having negative emotions, which we're talking about as we replay them, whether we're aware of it or not, so on. Every doctor will tell you this. It creates a cascade of negative chemistry in the body. Okay. Adrenaline goes out of balance. Cortisol goes out of balance. Hundreds of chemical reactions that are designed for repair and so on get compromised. All that happens. Your immune system has got to go deal with it. And so here's your immune system dealing with all this, or you're in trouble, okay? Right. There's only so much to it. And so you start developing physical things. Enough time goes by. Hiatal hernia, AFib, acid reflux, and other things as time goes on, probably that's just the way it goes. But bring peace to the system. And now you allow your immune system to go take care of its normal job. Seem right? Yes, I agree. All right. So let's shift from there for a moment. We're still exploring right? and reframing and all of that. Your stepfather, he came in the scene, you're age 10 or 11? Yeah. Okay. All right. 
at that time, as far as you know, did you perceive him as a potential source of love or not? No, never. Never. You never. didn't like him to, to begin with. No, it's um, he he was him and my step brothers uh, or my stepfather was Hispanic. And if uh, a lot of people know, it's a very strict household. Very strict. So. Sorry for the noise. And so he raised his kids and us very strict. And I wasn't used to that type of strict, very strict household. So to me, he was a bear, which my being raised with my mom, living with my grandparents, it was much more a house full of love. Um, there were still rules, boundaries, limitations, but they were much more free range All as right. parents would say today. And there was a lot more love with any discipline. You know, there was apologies and hugging and, and I love you's and stuff like that. Um, that never came from, he didn't hug his own kids until they were 30 or something, 30 years old. So as far as you know, if you know, why would he behave in that way? No love, strict, and all of that. Because his upbringing was far worse. It was physically abusive. We're not, see, important phrase here, Amber. We're not, we're not excusing anyone's behavior here. Your mother's, your stepfather. Yeah. We're not excusing it. We are trying to understand it that helps us soften it it helps give us freedom from it right okay so we need to understand and that's why we're exploring this is again form of reframing and all of that but to understand where he's coming from um let me ask his you. his father was very physically abusive to them to to my stepfather when okay. he was a kid, right? and he told as, stories, and so he learns. That's a way. That's that is a way to conduct oneself, I guess, and then reflects that because that's the way it should be, right? Okay, that's all he knew. Yeah, and, and behind that, I'm guessing here because I don't know him, but I'm just so I'm guessing. Um, behind that is is I don't feel good about me. And you may like this term. I need to, I need to have a sense of control. All right. I need to have a sense of control and I can do it by being the big, bad bear, or big, bad wolf or whatever. And, and lay down the law for everybody do it my way and nowhere else kind of thing. Would that be in there someplace? Yeah, that's, um, I mean, again, like you said, I don't know his reasons. I mean, in later years, he softened and, you know, uh, was much more pleasant to talk with. And so I could understand, you know, some of his, his reasoning. And him and my mother married after knowing each other for a month and put five kids three uh, three teenagers i was almost a teenager and a my little brother who was um i don't know how to explain that we'll say um very very add adhd troubled and so they're trying to make their marriage work get five kids to get along <laughs> everything that comes with that so it was you know, Vietnam. Yeah, the, uh, the of a household. Under <laughs> these circum under respect. these circumstances, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing, yeah. is the only way with five kids, five kids, each of it, each of which is trying to push their own limits and boundaries and see how far they can go and all this stuff. Very natural right. kind of thing. Right. Five of them doing it all these different ages, coming from different three from a Hispanic background and two from another background and. and 
I mean, that is that is a calamity uh, from the beginning, potential calamity. Yes. So the only way to control, I use that word again, the only way to control that is to put your foot down, put your fist down, you know, it, this is the way it is, and you guys better shape up kind of thing. Yeah. We needed to shut up and be seen and not heard and ideally be not seen and not heard. He just wanted quiet so they could work on their marriage. I mean, I understand what he wanted. <laughs> I don't yeah, necessarily okay. agree with it, but no. I understand where he's coming from. Okay, well, that's the important word. We're looking to understand, okay? We're not excusing the behavior. Even right. with all the stuff and the reasons why and everything else that we can explore, he still knows better. Yes. At some level. He's an adult. He knows better at some level. Okay. Okay. We're going we're gonna to assume that anyway. All right. So, the, but the point is we're, we're here to understand. Now, let me ask you this question about both your mother and your father, stepfather. Um, would I be correct in assuming that their biggest need or one of their biggest needs, if not their biggest, would be love. Yes, correct. If they indeed were filled with love, both of them, would we be having any of the problems that you're talking about? No. No. Okay. So they didn't have, are they both living? No, both deceased. Okay. All right. So what I want to get to, what we want to end up trying to do our best at owning is the idea that none of this is your issue. It's their issue is what I'm trying to say. You, you, you may have bought it. Yes. Yeah. You may have bought it, but that's just a very young you buying something uh, and we need to unbuy it. Refund. <laughs> You've got this sense of humor. I want to put it in a bottle, my dear me, <laughs> and, and sell it to the world or something. <laughs> I guess, but refund. I mean, <laughs> technically, that's what EFT does. Yeah. Well, okay. So I have in mind, let's bring in, bring in unseen therapists. We've done a little reframing. Okay. We've talked about some back when we explored some stuff, where stuff we're coming from, and this kind of stuff. <sighs> We've put some stuff hopefully on the table. So I'm thinking of, of doing the unseen therapist session, but, but the, the aim here, at least as I'm seeing, and I want you to correct this aim if, if there's something missing in it. There's a presumption in this aim. The presumption is you have bought a bunch of stuff from your parents, mother, stepfather, which is understandable. It has not been resolved in you. It has fear in it and a bunch of stuff like that. Time has gone on. You've gotten older. And your system is now seemingly because of that. Developing symptoms, AFib, hiatal hernia, acid reflux. And so we want to aim at that potential cause, see what we can do with that. And then we'll, we'll know when time goes by, how the other issues may be, the symptoms may be affected. But am I, am I on track? Would you change that any place? No, I don't think so. That seems on track. Okay. All right. Well, I'm... Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't take many notes. I've been talking. I didn't take many notes here. I wrote down age six. What was there at age six that we talked about? Can you recall? Oh, the, um, the Christmas uh, school oh, Christmas oh, pageant. Oh. And I walked home and my mom yelled at me for not waiting for my ride. Yeah. Okay. I called you stupid. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right which I don't specifically remember her saying that, but I remember her yelling at me and be, being very angry. Okay. I think what I'd like to do, could we usually launch off of a specific event? 
is to take something around dinner time at four o'clock. And oh. that's around age 10 or 11. Okay, now right. I, I know other stuff with your mother is built up, like age six, other thing. I understand that. But now you've okay. got your stepfather in there adding to, adding to it. Okay. We usually like to go back as far as we can because that's, that's the more farther, farther back we go, the more foundational. But in this case, I think we'd go to the age 10 or 11 thing, something at dinner time. Okay. Um, and see where that takes us, that specific event. Now, you didn't give me a specific event. You gave me sort of a generalized, you know, dinner time, four o'clock, et cetera. Can you give me a specific event um, that you can specifically recall? Yes. All right. Um, yeah. Around dinner time, we would, we would have dinner and then my parents would sit at the dining room table and bond with each other and talk. And the kids were all told to leave. And so I would go down in the living room and be watching TV and overhear their conversation and try to connect and get involved. And so I would be like, Oh, I heard this or say this or, um, and get yelled at by both of them, like extremely yelled at. So like, you know, stay out of adult business or they wouldn't say that, but they'd be say, quit listening. You got those elephant ears and stay out of our business. And they would just, where I was trying to connect, it was the door was slammed in my face saying, don't connect. All right. you know, the, term the term elephant ears is a term you remember or one you're making up now? Yeah, there was some term like that. I'm making a note here. Hold on. Something like that in there. And I just remember the yelling and. Okay. Okay. Now that's what they did. Remember what we're looking for is your response. What was it? Um, just hurt, emotionally hurt. I would just go away and all right, disconnect and shut down and just go watch TV or all right. Let me ask you. Let me ask you this. I, we did this before earlier, but I, on this event, I want to ask you: um, if you if you closed your eyes and and ran this movie, this scene, being yelled at and the elephant ears, stop listening and for adult conversation, all that stuff. Um, what number from, from zero to 10 would you think you'd get to? I guess a nine. All right. The guess is good enough for our, for our purposes here. Um, as you're making that guess, are you feeling anything physically, a tightness someplace or what? Yes, my chest and stomach feels um, like hurt. Okay. And it feels, it feels like a little um, heartburn, which is a symptom of acid reflux a lot of times. Oh, okay. So... You are, as you tune into this, even though you're guessing, um, you're getting some form of, you're calling it heartburn, but some form of physical response like acid reflux. Yeah, I'm feeling chest pains on my right side, which okay. are usually um, heartburn in my experience and uh, my uh, doctor's view. And usually I'll, I'll take a, heartburn um medication or something and it or i'll walk around and burp and it goes away okay all right okay so we're going to launch off of this this is the this is the place we're going to bring to unseen therapist there are other things going on in and around it we'll see where we go but 
but this is going to be fairly simple for you because I'm going to narrate the whole thing. Okay. And you just, you know, you know, close your eyes and go along with it and so on. However, 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 it would be very useful, very useful if this, if you joined in on this, should you remember something or something else pops up in all of this? Because that's, that's you and I and the unseen therapist working together. Love is best when shared. Okay. Okay. So if anything comes up, feel free to say, hey, wait, I just thought of this or whatever. Okay. Okay. Other than that, we're going to go have this little journey. And, and uh, sometimes unseen therapist has a little sense of humor. So you got to put up with that sometimes. We'll see. <laughs> okay. All right. So go ahead, close the eyes, take a nice, deep, you know, relaxing breath. And as a way of aligning yourself with unseen therapist, pure love, just go ahead and just recall a simple loving moment and nod your, nod your head whenever you're there. All right, good. Yeah, we're just aligning ourselves and we're going to, She's always guiding us, by the way. We're not always listening. <laughs> That's the point. But for now, we're saying, hey, listen. We're going to hand you a little something to you. We're going to want a little help. And we are listening. But she does a little dance. You know, hooray, hooray. Somebody's listening. Okay. So shift your focus now, Amber. Back to, you know, age 10, 11, something like that. You've finished dinner. You're off in another room and you can hear your parents talking, trying to bond, doing their adult kind of, and you a very natural kind of thing. Want to, you're overhearing it. And, and you're trying to comment on this, trying to get some love, if you will, trying to be part of the picture. This kind of thing. And you get instead of, gee, that's a good point or something nice like that. Okay. Thanks for listening. Thanks for what you're saying. You're getting something like, stop listening to us adults, elephant ears. There's a hurt going on. Maybe some fear, maybe some guilt, maybe but something about you is now feeling. I'm going to use the term unloved. Would that be a good term? Yes. Okay. Feeling unloved. Now we're going to send that to unseen therapist in a little bit. But I think there's something else we need to do first. And I want to have you imagine, if you would, a jail cell. It's got three walls, and the front wall is bars, you know, with a door that's locked, and you're sitting in the jail cell. Unseen therapist comes along and unlocks the door. Swings it open, and you can leave the jail cell anytime. You want walk outdoors, free, and so on. But before you do, counsels unseen therapists, let's spend a little time on something else while you're still here. Right? And if you would imagine both your mother and your father in front of you, you know, while they're living. You could even have them if you wanted to discussing this material over dinner time right? that you are overhearing. But the thing to notice, says unseen therapist, both of them, as you've mentioned earlier, have as one of their greatest needs, if not greatest need, love. They both come from very strict places, very demanding places, very... Uh, so, and they've never resolved any of it. They don't know really how to express love. 
They don't know how to, to their children, especially, okay? Maybe a little here and there, you know, maybe some softening, but generally speaking, oh, quite critical. They're reflecting their own unrest. And you are sitting there as the target to it. But as you look at them, as you look at them, you notice that within each of them is a metaphorical love sponge. It's like a water sponge, but it fills up with love and then overflows instead of water. Each of them have one really pretty dry, really pretty empty. She says, then notice yourself, Amber, as a result of all of this, you've got a love sponge as well. And it needs a little help because you need to, unre to resolve your emotional reaction to these other things, not, not good enough defective, not lovable. These aren't logical, as we pointed out, but uh, emotionally, there they are. And so we want to fill up your emotional love sponge. Now, unseen therapist is loaded with love. That is what she is. She is a walking love sponge of overflowing love every place. Right? It's very easy for her to share her love with you. And fill up your love sponge. So for the moment, spend a little time. Do this as best you can. You may not do it perfectly, but who cares? Okay, You're, it's the intention that matters here. All right. So let your parents for the moment fade off into the nothingness. And there you are in the jail cell and you got your love sponge and unseen therapist is sharing it, sharing it, sharing it. So spend some time. Imagine it being filled up. Imagine elephant ears and things like that being sort of uh, fading off into nothingness. Spend a little time doing that. And whenever you're done doing it, as far as you can go, whatever it is, just say, I'm ready and we'll go on. But take your time. Okay. All right. Good. With your eyes still closed, Amber, tell me, tell me, were you able to do that successfully, partially? Tell me what happened. Yes. Um, when I think of my parents yelling at me for listening, it, I just feel sorry for them. I, I feel sad they didn't get the love that they needed. Okay. And it doesn't bother me when they okay. say those things to me. But how about the love sponge filling up for you? Was that hard to do, easy to do? It's filled, it's half full? Where's that? No, that was pretty easy to do, but I've practiced a lot okay. of that. All My right. Happy thoughts fill it up real quickly, and then I start expanding it All right. beyond my body and the planet and the All universe. Right. Well, that's good, because, because now we're going to – in your imagination, allow your parents to fade back into the jail cell. And there they are in front of you at the dinner table with their empty love sponges. And, you know, they're sort of overhearing you and they're starting to go, you yeah, know, nah, 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 that amber, you know, it's this elephant ears. <laughs> they're at least harboring the thoughts before they've even yelled them. All right. But now, with the help of unseen therapists and her love sponge, if you need it, or perhaps just your own love sponge overflowing. Share that. Don't give it to them like send it. You don't have it. Share it. Expand it to their love sponge. And allow those love sponges in your imagination, those love sponges, 
to fill up. And as you do in your imagination, notice that the any tension that may have been there in their bodies is starting to soften. They're not used to love. It begins to soften. You're doing the, a, a very loving favor here. They're gone now. That doesn't mean that they don't still need it. Uh-huh. Fill it up. And you might even want to notice gestures that they might make would be softening. Facial expression, softening. Tension, maybe, or anger, or this kind of thing in the eyes. Softening. Softening. Do that for a little while. And whenever you've completed that, just say, I'm ready, and we'll keep the eyes closed, and we'll proceed. Okay. All right, good. All right, now, got one more thing we want to do here. And that is, when we started here, before we brought an unseen therapist, you were guessing that your emotional response, the hurt involved, was like a nine, and you had you had some physical things, tightness in your chest, and your stomach and a little heartburn, this kind of thing. That's in your imagination now. And we're not asking you to actually create AFib, you know, acid reflux and hiatal hernia and the like. But imagine them for the moment. We're going to give it to the unseen therapist as a metaphor. In fact, we're going to we're going to create a metaphor for this. It's as though the heartburn, should be the heartburn, the AFib, um, and the related things was like an unwanted vibration around your heart. Ta 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 ta, like that. Uh-huh. Again, we're not asking you to make your heart vibrate. It's an imaginary metaphor. Mm -hmm. Unseen therapist sees this. She understands what it's all about. She understands this is your reaction, your response as a very young child to something you could not control at that time. You're on the wrong end of elephant ears type statements. You're being yelled at. You're hurt. Ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. In your imagination, unseen therapist then sends a, or you allow her to send, a nice, cooling, loving, healing breeze that goes towards you, enters into your chest, surrounds your heart very lovingly, very lovingly. And that unwanted vibration, all of those symptoms involved who have less and less cause now start to fade. Ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. Then we'll do that again. Metaphorically, unwanted vibration around your heart represents all these symptoms, including AFib. Here comes ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta. Here comes the cooling breeze, ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta. 
ta 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 And maybe, if you can, notice your parents sitting there in the jail cell, about ready to leave, by the way, looking at you with a very loving gaze. And maybe for the first time, if you can imagine it, they are something nice, saying something nice to you. They're inviting you into the conversation. If it works, fine. If not, but let them then leave to freedom. The jail cell. You are still there. Ta 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 ta. Ta ta. So do that. Cooling breeze, ta 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 ta, again and again. More times if you want, until you've gone as far as you think you can go. And then just open your eyes, and we'll we'll talk. No, don't open your eyes. Don't open your eyes. Just say, "I'm ready." We have one more thing to do. Okay, I'm ready. All right. Okay. Now, there you are in the jail cell. It is open. It is open. You can walk out of it if you want. If you really do, and, and be honest with yourself on this, if you really do feel completely free, if you do, go ahead and walk out. Walk outdoors, get in a hot air balloon if you want to, and float off into the skies. If not, if not, just be honest with yourself on that. Open your eyes and let me know what happens. Okay. So clue yeah. me in. Clue me in. I, I left the cell. All right. Um, they, my mom and stepfather wanted me to leave the cell with them when they left. They were asking me to come with them. Uh -huh. Okay. But you didn't let me, so I stayed. Well, shame on me, right? <laughs> well, no, I just was following the, yeah, the vision, vision. And so then we walked, then when I left, they were there and we walked out and they kind of flew away because they're already on the other side. So, okay. Now, Excuse me. we want to do a little testing. Right? So if you would close your eyes. Go back to this event where you were guessing that you were an eye, but now you, you don't guess anymore. You're actually going to get into it, all right? Mm -hmm. And really vividly imagine it. I mean, there they are, and they are yelling at you, you know, elephant ears, you know, and they're really trying to get to you and shut you down and how dare you and all that hurt you were having and everything else. And tell me if you're still a nine. Tell me if those physical things happen. Just tell me. Mm, no, it makes me smile. Um, that's usually a sign that I know I'm shifting or have shifted a lot. Because um, when I see them or hear them calling me names and it's just, it's, it's more the adult me there now. Okay. Um, than the child me and I just smile and, laugh it's what they well, what, say doesn't affect me it's about them okay what about the tightness in the chest and the stomach um my stomach feels fine there may be a ghost feeling in the chest but it's decreased significantly well if your emotional response originally was a nine 
Is it a, a two zero. or zero? No, zero. zero. Yeah. When, when I can smile and laugh at the incident, then I know it has nothing to do with me. That it, it, well, let's it, do another, that tells me. Let's do another level of testing. Okay. Okay. Close your eyes again. And this time I'm going to run the same movie, but this time yeah. it's a little different. We are looking for what might be not done yet. Okay. And that's why we test. So you want to exaggerate the sights, the sounds, the feelings. You want to literally try to get your symptoms back. Try to get upset. And tell me what happens. Still funny to me. Okay. All right. Well, that that's open the eyes. Okay. Okay. That's um, that, of course, is a good clue that we did something worthwhile here. Okay. But again, I, I never want to be fooled by a temporary result. So tomorrow morning when you get up, run that same movie again and see what shows up. Chances are there'll okay. be if, if something shows up, some intensity, it will be another aspect, something that wasn't on the table to begin with. Something else related shows up kind of thing. So you want to go after that one, you know, with the skills you're learning in our advanced course and all of that. Um, so how'd we do? Um, really good. It was a spiritual experience for me, as uh, you've talked about in your training. Okay. Um, well, I want to emphasize again that we don't know for sure if what we were aiming at is really a cause or a central cause of the AFib and the other symptoms. Okay. Right. We, susp we suspect so, but the only way you're going to know that is as time goes by and you eat at six o'clock or seven o'clock instead of four o'clock <laughs> and, <laughs> and you might want to test it, but that would be a way of testing, wouldn't it? Yes. Okay. That would be a way of testing. That would be a very good way of testing. Okay. Now I wouldn't overdo it. I would, I would, you know, I, I'm going to guess at this for you, but you eat at four o'clock or this early time that is. Yeah. It's already before. five o'clock here. So, okay. Well, all right. And then maybe have a little snack at seven 30. Start right. that, start that way or something like that. Okay. And build into it. But see, if you do have the AFib or any of the other symptoms, you want to stop okay. right there and say, well, is it really that I ate at 7.30? Or what's coming? What does this remind me of? What does this feeling remind me of? And that can point you to other specific events, other things we haven't put on the table today, and so on. Because, see, uh, when the symptoms appear, if we're paying attention, ah, the clues come right with them. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Interesting. Anything else you want to go over? Um, no, I just, I was going to share some stuff that happened in the um, scenario in the, uh, I don't know what term you would use the uh, session. Um, what is it? A vision when, vi when the visualization uh, um, and I don't go, know if you want ahead. to leave this yeah. in or edit it out. It's well, up go, to you later. Go ahead. Um, but both my my stepfather and my mother came to me in uh, in a way here in in not in my visualization, but outside of it because they have both since passed. Uh -huh. And so they both came to me as they are now. And that was a whole different experience. They were more enlightened beings, if you will, um, whatever term you, you choose to describe that. And they were just sending me love and saying, sorry, but yet they weren't, they're not the same beings they were when they were here. Um, in the jail cell, 
in that visualization, they were just apologizing to me and saying sorry and were um, when they felt when the love expanded and they experienced their love sponge filling, they were like their eyes got big and they just started crying and feeling like they got hit by some sort of energy beam or field that they had never experienced and their whole beings changed. And then they were saying sorry and stuff like that. And then the, um, my stepfather and mother appeared to me as beings from the other side. And my stepfather kissed me on the forehead, which was quite strange and quite um, beyond him when he was living. Yeah. Um, But not obviously now. Yeah. So that was a very interesting experience and not, not surprising to me um, because that has happened to me before where somebody from a loved one from the other side has come forward to me in, in ways, not all the time, but once in a while. And it's usually a very loving and, and I had, I was experiencing tears when, when all of that happened. So it was, was very profound lesson in how what others do to us has nothing to do with us. And what we do to other people has nothing to do with them. They take it on that way, however, it needs some resolution. (laughs) Which I did. Yeah. Which I took on what they were venting. Yeah. And I can see it so much more clearly and not feel hurt over it. Great. 